All right, welcome back to CS164. It's great to have you with us again this week. This week, uh, David's away, so he's asked me, Chris Gerber, to come in and uh, introduce our guest speaker. We have Edwin Guarn in from Microsoft. He's a senior academic developer. Developer <laughs> evangelist. Nice. Senior academic developer evangelist. That's right. For higher education, New England. Yes. <laughs> and he's specifically going to be talking to us about the Windows mobile platform. Um, he's got a few guests with him, so I'll let him uh, continue with his introductions. Okay, thank you very thanks, much, Chris. All right, thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, how many of you were in CS50 this past fall? By chance, awesome. Were you guys at the hackathon we had at Nerd? Okay, so we are. So that was you know me working with David. You guys did an awesome job. So we're really excited today, though, uh, to um, talk to you about what's going on with uh, Windows Phone, especially with our Nokia partnership, and developing some stuff. So how many of you have done your iPhone and Android apps de uh, app development? Okay, cool. So we're going to walk through some of the steps on what to do today. We're going to talk about XNA game development, um, sort of what's happening with Nokia, and uh, I want to introduce Dean Andrews from Nokia to Hello. talk to you uh, for the first half. Thanks. Okay, so I am uh, Dean Andrews from Nokia. I do business development, particularly regarding apps for the uh, Windows Marketplace ecosystem, and particularly focused in on the United States. I stole these slides from uh, an event, recent event we did at Mobile World Congress, so I wanted to make sure I had the bibliography correct here coming to Harvard. Okay, uh, so we've heard about the iOS and Android. How many of you have ever laid hands on a Windows phone? Okay, how many of you ever, have ever touched a Nokia Windows phone? Oh, two, maybe three, all right. Well. Hopefully by the end of this lecture today, you're going to stop this nonsense on iOS and start developing on, uh, on Windows Phone. All right. Now, I think you're probably all a little young to remember this, but uh, actually Nokia at one point in the early 2000s had 40% market share in terms of phones in the United States. Now, I doubt that many of you have ever owned a Nokia phone. Is there anyone here that has owned a Nokia phone? Oh, well, actually, a small handful. Probably your ancestors, maybe uh, parents or grandparents owned Nokia phones. Nonetheless, uh, the company made some uh, missteps in the early 2000s, and we had some very smart companies, namely Apple and Google, come into our domain and kick us in the head, in the United States in particular, not so much globally, but definitely in the United States. But uh, Nokia is not filled with dummies, and uh, we didn't lay down and die. And what we did in the last few years is to plot our comeback, particularly into the United States, and it's now well underway. And if I had to sum up our strategy in just two phrases, it would be these. That Nokia plans to regain our smartphone market share in a partnership that we have with Microsoft regarding Windows Phone. And then we also, with our other platforms, which are still alive and well, and still a dominant force globally, we plan to connect the next billion customers that are uh, alive and well around the world, but unable to afford the expensive smartphones that are sold in the United States. These are two of our Nokia Windows Phone products. Um, the two that are missing are the Lumia 800 device, which I have right here, I'll show you in a minute, and also the Lumia 710, which is currently available on the T-Mobile market. Uh, a couple of quick facts. Uh, one thing that's interesting about all of these products is that we began this partnership between Nokia and Microsoft, in, we announced it in February of 2011. And in a little over a year, we have produced four different smartphones using this operating system. And I, I do urge you to at least check one out in a store because they are quite remarkable. The Lumia 900 device you see there is the first Windows phone that is 4G LTE on the AT&T network. The Lumia 610 
and the Lumia 800 here are not currently available in the United States. They were not designed for the US market. They were designed to take advantage of the global market. And you'll see some information about that in a minute. These are 10 of the 13 awards that we've won on the Nokia Lumia 900 since we announced it. And many of these were before the phone was actually available to the public. We announced the phone at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show in January of this year in Las Vegas. And it's been quite remarkable, the reaction to the phone since then. I know it's sometimes hard to imagine with the dominance of uh, iOS and in Android, but again, we've been at this game, Nokia's been at this game quite a long time, and I would uh, uh, throw down our hardware against any competitor in the world. We are quite good at design, manufacturing, and we know a ton about uh, mobile uh, telephony. We have more mobile technology patents than any company in the world. And we've leveraged many of them to create uh, these remarkable products. We have a very interesting app strategy. I would call, I've been in high tech for a long time. I've been in mobile for years. And I find this strategy and this partnership with Microsoft quite remarkable. There are a lot of smart people in both companies working on this, two underdogs, if you will, even though we're both giant corporations, they're two underdogs in this domain, in this market. And uh, it is a multifaceted strategy. This slide is just uh, saying something about our app strategy. Again, we are working hard to uh, uh, kickstart the Windows Marketplace ecosystem. Again, it's an underdog if you compare it to the other two. I believe the latest figures are that it has 80,000 applications in the Windows Marketplace compared to 750,000 in uh, iOS uh, and uh, 350, 400 in Android. Uh, however, uh, you'll see some interesting stats later about how quickly it's growing. These partners here have done something interesting with us. And again, you know, we're, we're thinking this through. We do have some exclusive applications on Nokia's Windows phones in order to kind of draw attention to them. So we have partnered with these major partners, and each of these uh, businesses is doing something on their uh, Nokia Windows phone applications, their features, for example, or assets that are not on iOS or Android, their apps on those platforms. And they're for, they'll be for a limited time uh, only on Nokia Windows phones. And then when the time window is finished, they'll be available on all Windows phones. Again, about the kind of uh, multifaceted elements, uh, we are <coughs> embracing companies directly. And we're also using both mainstream and social media to get the word out. We've done some interesting partnerships with Red Bull and some of the uh, interesting uh, in-person competitions they do around the world. We also, I don't know if any of you know this, but two Fridays ago, we hijacked Times Square in the United States here in New York. And uh, we filled it to capacity, stopped traffic, and Nicki Minaj performed a concert in, in, in conjunction with us in Times Square. And the interesting thing about this is that, again, every detail is thought through. The reason that we partnered with Nicki Minaj is that she is the 11th most followed person on Twitter in the world. And she has over 11 million followers. And uh, attending the concert, we invited some of the most followed uh, bloggers uh, and tweeters in the world to watch the show from Times Square. And all of this is working quite effectively. We basically, uh, while we launched the uh, Lumia 710 at T-Mobile just a few months back, and the Lumia 900 is only available as about a week 
or so from AT&T. The traction's been quite amazing. There are now three industry analysts that say that the Windows Phone ecosystem will be number two in the world by 2015. That's not Nokia or Microsoft talking. Those are independent uh, mobile industry analysts that say that. And by the way, number one they forecast is Android, not iOS. Uh, we've had you know, incredible reaction from real people, not just uh, you know, high-tech magazine reviewers, but we have 4.5 out of uh, five star ratings on T-Mobile from people who have purchased and used the product every day. Uh, we've had, T-Mobile has actually increased their orders of the 710 twice in two months. Uh, AT&T, I don't know if you've seen any of the news about that, but there have been, uh, they, we've sold out many AT&T stores of the Lumia 900 across the country, and there have been positive reviews from most every major news source, both tech and mainstream. This is uh, the year-over-year -year increase in applications in the Windows marketplace, 300% increase. The Windows marketplace, because of all this, I believe it's you know, directly related to this partnership, was the fastest app store to 50,000 apps of any app store, including iOS and Android. And uh, its current, the number of applications submitted daily, I do not have the exact number, I believe it's about 300 per day, is now outpacing the other two major app stores. Again, uh, we are very focused on global. That's one of Nokia's greatest strengths. And at Mobile World Congress, we announced uh, the opening of many other markets that we're addressing with Microsoft in this partnership. And so for people who develop on this platform, there's quite an incredible opportunity. Uh, part of what I do in addressing apps specifically is I look to find the apps that are very compelling, that we believe we can build a story around, and that for us, selfishly, will help us move our products. And when we find those applications, we make people aware of them. We have, and again, a, a whole team of people that are actually uh, marketing and promoting the applications in this ecosystem. So it's something to be aware of. This is one of the companies. This uh, is a game that actually won a Nokia-sponsored hackathon for Windows Phone. Again, uh, you know, something that's, uh, I think, compelling to developers is the ability to monetize in multiple markets. We have an incredible amount of resources, including uh, localization resources, uh, that we can bring to bear for this. This just kind of touching on some of the things again. Uh, we have a lot of resources for developers and you can find them here. Uh, this is my contact information. I believe this, you know, this will be posted, this video will be posted and also the um, slides I think will be sent out. But in any case, let me jump over to the device. Okay. All right, so this is the uh, Lumia 800. Again, it's available over the web, unlocked, but uh, it, you, know, you can certainly get a better deal uh, for, uh, at AT&T or T-Mobile. Uh, it's, again, you, you have to touch one because looking at one over a camera like this does not do it justice. It's uh, this incredible unibody construction that everyone talks about. This AMOLED uh, a clear black screen uh, is quite remarkable. It's, again, the whole OS, it's, it's, I've, I think, again, I've used every kind of uh, smartphone out there, and I certainly am biased, but you just have to check it out. It's incredibly snappy interface. I know that many of you have touched a Windows phone, but I just want to touch on some of the unique elements here. Uh, one thing I think that, that uh, makes a difference is this whole live tile thing, which we're updating. These are elements about the people in my kind of social network circle. 
I uh, am very actively checking my phone, but uh, if I wasn't, the uh, missed calls, the uh, text messages, and my uh, business email for Nokia would all have updates here about uh, what email were, were coming through. This Nokia Drive is a Nokia-created application. We have uh, many software development teams, and we produce our own Windows Phone applications. This is leveraging our uh, location resources. Nokia owns a company called Navtech, which is one of the two central geodata sources of the world. It's used by every product from personal navigation devices to uh, mapping services and everything else. And this is uh, uh, basically a driving navigation app that we created. It's quite cool. I definitely recommend it. You can download it from the Windows Marketplace on any phone, actually. Um, the Office integration, again, just you know, promoting what Microsoft has done, not us, but the, uh, the integration of Office is uh, quite amazing. All the Office tools, as well as Xbox. And again, these integrations are quite unique. This is my... Uh, back in the office, sorry. My kids now uh, choose uh, playing with my phone over uh, their iPod touch devices when we're out and about together. This is my little avatar here. These are my friends. And uh, I'm telling you that the, the audience is in, a, in a, a, you know, uh, Perhaps Edwin has the numbers on the number of Xbox users uh, in the United States alone, but it, there are millions of them. And it kind of, the, the joining of these existing audiences, both on, uh, for the Office products and for Xbox, is in the, in the ability to kind of leverage those audiences through this device is quite powerful and different from the other, uh, other platforms out there. Just if you haven't seen this, uh, the design, which is called Metro, is, is quite fresh and uh, interesting. Now, again, I talk with businesses every day as part of my job. And many of them, when they actually make the change and start using a uh, Windows phone daily, they tell us that the... Uh, they tell us that the actual interface feels much fresher and newer to them. And if you think about it, it's obvious why. While the iPhone rocked the world when it came out in 2007, 2008 time frame, it actually hasn't changed that much since then. But this is much newer, much fresher. And, and again, people who are diehard, I, I work with people who are diehard iOS developers, die-hard Android developers, and I see them kind of open or change their minds as they use one of these devices. There is a lot new here. There is a lot that end users find compelling, uh, and it's something that uh, developers, this is this panorama. You'll see basically that there's a depth to the interface. There's the imagery behind, which again, and all this stuff is pulled from favorites and saved. It's a, it's a beautifully well-integrated system. But there's like a front layer, which you can, address, you can customize personally, or you can have applications customize, or applications uh, that can take advantage of this in their design. And again, the ability, this is just a new thing about customization. You can completely customize this home page and pin things. I can pin applications to my home page that I'm most interested in. This is the full set of applications. This list is the full set of applications on the phone. But this home screen has either applications themselves pinned to it or even sub-elements of applications. This, uh, this here, for example, is telling me the surf report for Nantasket Beach live, it's updating, it's live tile. So it's bringing useful information to an individual to this home screen. You know, these are my most used applications, Netflix, little one uh, for uh, one notes about, uh, you know, my hotels and different things of that sort. 
This is the CNN app that I mentioned, the exclusive app. But uh, again, I could go on and on in terms of the hardware. Uh, the, you know, I've dropped this phone several times by accident, and it's still up and running. But try doing that with some of our competitor phones. The Carl Zeiss uh, optics technology is world renowned. This is an uh, eight megapixel camera on here. The Lumia 900 has both the back and front facing cameras. And you will definitely, uh, if you keep your eyes open, you'll hear more announcements in the future. Uh, that's, that's all I have. I'll pass it back to uh, Edward. Before we move on, is there any questions for Dean from a Nokia perspective? The general stereotype about Nokia phones is that they're indestructible. Yep. Uh, how much effort do you put into getting that type of uh, durability? A, a, a ton. In, in fact, uh, again, you know, we've we've watched the world change in front of us. You know, again, kind of referencing what I said earlier. Uh, but but we've never changed some of those kind of founding elements. I believe the reason that uh, Nokia became the number one handset maker on earth, and interestingly, if I didn't mention it before, we still are the number one mobile handset maker in the world. And, and that kind of uh, quality of design, ruggedness, uh, is something that we've started and never stopped. It's built into our manufacturing and testing process. We have this whole philosophy that goes very deep in terms of manufacturing efficiency and rooting out uh, defects in quality. And we retain all of that to this day, even in the face of very difficult competition. What uh, mobile providers is it? Go so uh, in the United States, so we have, we have uh, partners around the world. Uh, Can you the question? Oh, yes. So the uh, question was, what uh, carriers is the, our products on? So for the United States, Right now, today, we have uh, Nokia Windows Phone products on T-Mobile and AT&T. Uh, but look for more uh, information in the future. And then around the world, we have a wide variety of partners, and we're constantly adding to that list. Do you think that's the biggest obstacle to uh, domestic adoption? I, it has been one of Nokia's challenges in the past. Uh, but I think, again, you know, in kind of many strategic moves, part of it being a partnership with Microsoft, I uh, am, am incredibly confident about our chances right now with our Windows Phone products because when we approach carriers now in the United States, we actually come in with Microsoft together. And uh, actually carriers, while again, we've, we've had our challenges in the United States, they understand Nokia's reputation for quality uh, products, and so they you know, are absolutely willing to talk with us. And again, AT&T is actually, I believe, the largest uh, carrier in terms of subscribers in the United States right now. Yes. Yes. Uh, to do that, do you have any plans to like create uh, create Nokia retail stores or uh, or somehow you know market them in, in a more in a physical location outside of uh, of just like carrier branded stores? That's a great question. So the question was about um, whether we are selling our products exclusively through carrier stores or do we have our own plans for retail? And again, honestly, we actually had a handful of Nokia retail stores in the United States a few years ago. We had one in New York City on Fifth Avenue. We had one in Chicago. Uh, and we've, we closed those in the challenging times that we have. And for the current situation in the United States, we are focusing uh, very uh, strategically on carrier phone stores. 
But again, we've done some very interesting things, and in my, in my personal opinion, very effective things. We have armed, for example, uh, the vast majority of AT&T phone store staff with their personal Lumia 900 device for free. So that that is the device that they use every day, that they're very comfortable with, that they're very uh, uh, willing and able to promote the device to customers. And again, we, we have an incredible amount of research. We've been doing this a long time. And we know, in fact, I believe the statistic is that 80% of the people who walk into a carrier phone store have not yet made up their mind about what phone they'll be purchasing. So they rely extremely heavily on what the phone store staff recommends or suggests to them. And that's one of the reasons we made this move uh, with AT&T staff. However, to again get back to your question, uh, the Lumia products are available in Best Buy and other retail locations that are non-carrier specific, uh, but we are focused uh, on the carrier stores for the main thrust of this, this effort. So you showed on any sort of screen, all these things constantly Yes. How long does the battery last? Yeah, that's a, we get that question all the time. Uh, the, the question is, uh, how long does the battery last with all of these updated tiles? And I think uh, people kind of in the know about technology, that's one of the first things they wonder about. And, and I don't have the specific stats on battery life, but I can tell you that it's quite comparable to, uh, to other smartphones and, and how long they last, not just Windows phones, but all platform phones. And I think the best way to kind of uh, uh, convey how we do is to ask you to read the reviews. Again, we've been reviewed in every major news source from the New York Times, the Boston Globe, CNET, Engadget, on and on and on. They've all had hands-on reviews, and they all talk about battery life, and, and none of them you know, talk about that as a problem, even with this kind of amazing and new uh, live tile uh, technology of Microsoft's. Can you talk a little bit about the features or if anything you've taken from the Symbian kind of like you had before and how it turns into That's a great question. It's a, uh, the question is, uh, Symbian was our smartphone operating system before our partnership with Microsoft. Uh, it still exists today, but it's, uh, we don't focus at all on Symbian in the United States but it is still used globally. We still sell phones using the Symbian operating system. And I think, uh, to answer your question, what we really leveraged is um, just basically our, our deep research and our experience in Symbian. We did not so much leverage specific technology from the Symbian operating system, but I can tell you, and then this is you know the research for another time for you folks to go in in the, in the uh, Symbian was actually in many ways more powerful than iOS currently is now. Uh, and it was uh, at the time that the first iPhone was launched, including multitasking in terms of uh, uh, the uh, imaging technology on smartphones and on and on and on. Uh, but we, we just took the experience with that operating system and applied it uh, to the Windows phone. Should we move on? OK. All right. <laughs> Thanks Thank again, Dean. Really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I do want to show you some of the dev tools, but um, also kind of show you some of the favorite features that I use that might be uh, applicable to you while Glenn gets his uh, um, presentation started. Um, for example, um, so at least this is my phone. This is the Nokia 900, uh, Lumia 900. I just got married like two months ago, so that's why I have a picture. Of Thank you. I'll show this to my wife, the recorded video, so she knows that I actually talk about her in a good way. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, this is my home screen, but some of the things that are, you know, are really interesting to me is, uh, you know, I like to watch movies, right? So, um, you know, if I want to see what movies are playing locally, I just click on movies after I do a search. Uh, Oh, it's not showing the, the thing I want to do. But what's really interesting, though, is it suggests some of the apps 
that you can use to uh, download and find out uh, what your movies are. So for example, movies, and if you click on that, you can see IMDb, all these other things. Um, one of the things too that I, I used to have an iPhone, um, but that I really appreciate here is, uh, you know, a lot of my friends, I kind of group them, I text message them in groups. Um, but I also like to see a location where all of them are stored. So for example, I have a, you know, I'm from New York. Anyone from New York? Long Island, represent? All right, cool. <laughs> so if I go to New York Friends, What's interesting, I have a group of eight friends that are from New York, and it gives me their status updates um, if they updated recently. So I know Melissa just got back from Italy. Italy. Let's see if she has a status update. If not, I'll kind of show you what you can do. But for example, there's a text everyone. Uh, there's a send email to everyone. So if I click on text, you know, it automatically texts everyone in that specific group. I'm going to go back. Um, what's new? So, uh, you know, how many of you, you have Facebook and, you know, if you want to find out what their status is, you have to open up Facebook, see what the status is for that individual person, right? Here, it takes all my friends in that New York group and actually streams all the Facebook content and information uh, that are relative, uh, relevant only, again, to those friends. So, um, you know, what's new? This actually streams all the information. So, for example, this was updated on Saturday, uh, some 20 hours ago, 17 hours ago. So it can keep track. I don't have to open up Facebook, then I don't have to open up, um, you know, what, uh, what their status update is, right? Here, I have a pictures uh, tile as well. Um, so if for all my friends, New York friends, it actually shows and updates all their pictures. And these even show the pictures that I am included in. So if I want to creep on my friends or whatever, right, and I click on New York friends, um, it only shows relevant pictures uh, streamed from Facebook to what's, um, you know, any of those people on that specific list. Um, so, I mean, you know, those are some of the interesting things to me that, that actually make it uh, personal to me. Um, but anyway, I'm going to see if Glenn is available there. Uh, and we're going to get started with tools. Okay. Hey, Glenn, I'll let you speak. Are you there, buddy? I am here. How's everybody doing? Good. Everyone say hi, Glenn. Hi, Glenn. <laughs> all right, cool. So you got. Looks like a really, really friendly crowd. I can see all the smiles from over here. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. I can actually put the webcam on and, and let's see. Um, did you want to share your desktop and kind of. We could test this out and see if um, you know you can go through what you need to go through. Sure. All right. So everyone, uh, while Glenn is getting this set up, he is a developer evangelist out of Florida, and uh, he's going to be talking to you about XNA game development, about HTML5, jQuery um, to development on the phone. So uh, how many of you do HTML5, jQuery stuff in the past? Okay. Glenn, we got about at least 60% um, listed here. So if you write HTML5 and jQuery apps, you can actually uh, create some of these apps to, to run on the phone. And Glenn will briefly go through that. So bit.ly slash CS164 phone will bring you to uh, this site. It's uh, a SkyDrive uh, OneNote um, page. And it gives you links to all the different um, things. So uh, how many of you have developer accounts, say, for like iPhone or Android development? You either paid 99 or 29 bucks or whatever it is. Um, this outlines how you do that for free in the Windows Marketplace. And uh, one of the promotions that we're running right now is if you have two phones in the Marketplace. So rather than pay 99 bucks, go through these steps. You'll get it for free or contact me directly. I'll give you my information. Uh, Dean showed his Nokia 800 phone. And I think on Amazon.com, it was originally like $7.99, but $500 if you want it unlocked. If you publish two Windows phones in the marketplace, two Windows phone apps, I will give you a Nokia 800. So hopefully you do not sell that on eBay for $500. But um, if you're really interested in that, yeah, right? Uh, if you're a student, I can hook you up. Um, some of the things that Glenn will be talking about as well. How many are interested in that, like for real, a real phone? Publish two apps. I've run many hackathons, especially at CS50, you know, from fall. So if this is something you want to do even before the school year ends, I'm happy to do that for you. Let's do like a three-hour run. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll create a uh, phone camp or some type of app um, or some type of hackathon. Let's see. Over here um, on one of the other tabs, X and A, Glenn's going to go through X and A game development. So how many of you have developed games or are interested in developing games for the phone? You can monetize. You can do all that stuff. All right. There's X and A development. So these are some quick starts. Silverlight app development. I was going to go through some quick stuff. So if Glenn ends early, maybe I'll run through some of these things. But there's a video series. There are um, you know code samples uh, to really help you get started quickly. So um, again. Um, bit.ly uh, slash CS164 phone. There's another thing. If you want to go to get download the tools, if you go to bit.ly slash WP7SDK tools. So uh, WP7SDK tools brings you over here. 
And if you do have a Mac, which I know a lot of you have, if you have Boot Camp, you can go ahead and boot into Windows. Uh, when you go to that link, click on Download SDK, and you are all set. It's going to download all the tools that you need, VMWeb2.exe. Click Download, you're done. Um, and you'll get all the tools you need. So, seriously, if you're interested, I'm going to write my email address down here um, if you want to get that promotion to for a phone, a Nokia 800, which is absolutely stunningly sexy. All right, so uh, let's go back to Glenn. Glenn, you're all set. Chris, you're all set with the tape. All right, so with that, uh, round of applause for Glenn Gordon, please. All right. Thanks. So, Edwin, you'll need to be my proxy. If anybody uh, wants to ask a question, just feel free to interrupt me or I'm just going to keep going. You got it. Thanks, Glenn. Um, so, I'm going to show you uh, two approaches today for building uh, applications and games for Windows Phone 7. Uh, the first one is using the XNA framework, and the second one is going to be using an HTML JavaScript framework called uh, PhoneGap. Uh, with XNA, we're going to focus on this from the perspective of being able to write a very immersive two dimensional, three dimensional games. The X8 framework is something that's been around at Microsoft for several years. It was developed as a way for people to be able to write games for the Xbox 360 and have a very responsive environment that is uh, programmed at the level of managed code. And it's, it's been traditionally a challenge for people to have game development frameworks that are managed code because the perception there is there's a lot of overhead with that and uh, things like garbage collection can get in the way and, and for whatever reason, the code that you write might not be able to run at, for example, a high frame rate that a game might require. But the XNA framework kind of proved that that wasn't uh, you know, a, a real valid fear because they architected it really well to be able to call down into a lot of the lower level APIs and give folks that are used to traditional game development with a game loop and being able to paint the screen basically 30 times a second, uh, give a, a managed code way of doing that. So that's been around for a couple of years. The Xbox Live independent game market or indie game uh, market that's out there has a lot of games that people have written and published using XNA. XNA uh, also runs on the PC. And then with the introduction of Windows Phone a couple of years ago, we now have, in, in fact, three platforms that uh, can support XNA. You could actually take an approach to writing a game which would make it run on all three platforms, the Xbox 360, the PC, and the phone, with very minimal changes. The only thing you really have to consider is, well, what's the input, right? Because for a PC, it's keyboard and mouse. For an Xbox, a controller. And in the case of a phone, it's, it's essentially the touch screen and to some degree, the accelerometer. So we're building games in XNA for Windows Phone today, but realize that the skills that you use here and, and primarily uh, a lot of the code as well would translate to the other platforms. Um, so what I've got on the screen, assuming everybody can see it, is uh, Visual Studio, and this is just the basic install from the websites that uh, Edwin has given you earlier. When you have Visual Studio installed, you already have the, the tools in place to write um, XNN games. And so we're going to use Visual Studio, and we're going to be testing our game in the emulator, which is the second window over here. And this is going to allow us to, to write the game and run it as if it were running on a phone. And so that's where we'll see our output in a little bit. Um, so, Edwin, if at any point my screen freezes, please let me know and I'll pause and let it catch up. You got it. So, I'm going to do File New Project and just begin a new Windows Phone XNA project. Uh, within these template libraries, you have a lot of choices on the left hand side. So, we're going to pick XNA Game Studio 4. This is a Windows Phone game, and we're just going to leave it called Windows Phone Game 2, which is fine. And I'll click OK. So now it's asking me what version of the Windows Phone platform I want to target. This is the latest version that's out there, which is Windows Phone OS 7.1. So we'll click OK for that. Now what it gives us is two projects. One is the actual game itself. And the second one is a project that's going to have all our game content in it. When you're building a game in XNA, you can use a lot of traditional um, files that you would use in other types of games. For example, PNG files, GIF files, uh, wave sound effects. You can use uh, 3D models that come out of products like Blender or 3D Studio Max or Maya. And you can use all those assets within your game. What you're focusing on in the game then is actually writing the code. You're going to have the business logic. Well, in this case, it'd be the game logic. 
artificial intelligence, things like physics, um, you know, game timing, being able to save and load content, all that sort of stuff. So in this project, I'm going to simply go ahead and run it. So you can see what the project looks like with no work being done to it. So I hit the run button at the top of Visual Studio. It's going to deploy it to my emulator. And I, in a minute, I should see my game. Uh, now, at this point, are you guys seeing the blue rectangle on the screen? Okay, that's my game. Uh, so we hope everybody will buy it for 99 cents. Uh, but essentially what it's showing here is painting a blank screen, and it's up to us to populate this game universe and then the game screen with things that we need to show on the screen. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a graph. So I'm going to add an existing item. And I'm going to go out to a directory I have here. And these are just some sample files. Uh, this is a background of stars. So we want to display this in our game. So what we need to do is a couple things. First of all, we need a variable to hold that graphic. So I'm going to create a variable here of type texture 2D, and that's going to be called space BG for our space background. And then we want to pull in from that graphics file that texture. So I'm going to go down to a section of my code called load content. And this is where I would put my code to actually bring the content in that I'm going to be using within the game. So here I'll say space BG equals content dot load. I'm going to convert it to a texture 2D. And the, the name is space BG, just like that. And then the second thing I need to do is display it on the screen. So I'm going to scroll down to the draw. And if you see right here, we have a section of our code that is clearing our graphics device in a lovely shade of cornflower blue. Now that's why we got the blue rectangle a few minutes ago. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw that background texture to my screen. And I'm going to use something called a sprite batch. And I'm going to say I'm going to begin drawing. And I'm going to draw it, the graphic. Oops, lower case here. And the graphic is the space BG. We're going to start it at the top left-hand corner of the screen, so that's a two-dimensional gra uh, vector graphic with a value of zero for the x and y. And then we're also going to add this one extra part here, which is the tinting of the graphic. And we don't want any tinting at all. We just want it to be the pure background space graphic. And our sprite batch. On that, and we should have outer space. And we do. So everybody's ready to pay 99 cents for that, right? We're getting there. We're getting there. All right. So the next thing I'm going to do is add a, a layered graphic here of a spaceship. So I'm going to go through the same steps. I'm going to add an existing asset, a little UFO. And then I'm going to add some code to bring this UFO in. Or in. I'm going to create another text for 2D called ship. And also, I need to keep track of the position of the ship on the screen. Keep in mind that you can use X and A for building 3D games. It's a little bit more complex because you have to keep track of stuff in the 3D space. And you have to define a camera that is a view around your models in 3D space. Um, but it is a lot of fun once you get into the, get the hang of it. By so here's our ship position. C sharp. C sharp, sorry, just in case. Yes, this is C-sharp, that's right. So if you know Java, you can make this up easy. Right, the languages that x supports today are C-sharp and Visual Basic. All right, so here's the point at which we load our content. So we're going to say ship dot equals content dot load. 
and both the Vertex or 2D, and this is called uh, UFO. And the name of it actually is in the content project, so if I clicked on this, you would see the asset name down here, which is called UFO, but you could change that if you wanted to. And then the position of our ship is going to be and it's going to start at 0, 0. We could have used dot zero if we wanted. This is an alternative. And then finally we want to draw it on the screen. So we'll come down here and right after we draw the stars, we'll draw the ship. And the position is going to be ship position. And again, it's what? No ticking. Does anybody know why I put drawing of the ship after drawing of the stars? Yeah, you want the ship on top, that's right. So here's our ship. You'll notice it's not really in the top left, but that's only because the game orientation or the assumed orientation for a game is uh, landscape. You can change that if you want, but that's the assumed orientation. Yes? Is there a question? No, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, one more thing we're going to add here is moving the ship around the screen because it's no fun unless it moves. So we're going to have a variable here for the ship speed as well. And then you guys have to dust off your vector math for this kind of stuff, I'll tell you. That's a vector two, and we're gonna give it a speed of about 100 something per something. So then what we're gonna do is in the uh, update loop, this is where the game universe updates, but it's not involving drawing. So this is where we figure out how much movement needs to go on the screen, where a character is, if a character's dead, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So here we're going to say that the ship position is increased by the, the ship speed times something we're going to convert to a float. So that's a floating numeric variable. And I'm just going to split this on two lines so you guys can see it. We're going to take the game timer Lapse game time dot total seconds. This is an important thing to use because the update may not fire on a regular basis, but the game timer always keeps uh, you know a nice steady beat of what's going on in the game. So we'll run this. We should have some movement in our game. I don't know how well this will translate across the uh, live meeting. No, you're good. So there's our ship, and uh oh, what happened? Lost it. Okay. Go. Good. Because it doesn't know, the game doesn't know when we run out of screen. Uh, so what we're going to do, and I'm not going to type this here, I'm just going to add a snippet of code that I added earlier to actually, to actually balance my ship. And it's just saying, you know, if the X position is past the width, reverse the X position. If the Y position, or the X position is less than zero, reverse that. So it's basically going to give it a bounce. Pretty straightforward stuff. So now our ship's going to go around the screen, and at some point it'll bounce. Great. There it is. So space is, in, is not infinite anymore. All right. Um, a few other things we can do in this game to make it more worth 99 cents is we can add uh, some sound. So I think we bring in a sound effect. I add an existing item, bring in this uh, UFO flying sound, and then I want to play this sound. So I basically need a variable for that. So I create a sound effect variable. Um, hey Glenn, feel free to ask questions too, because I have some swag to give out for people that answer the question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What color shirt am I wearing? Green. Blue. 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 Blue.
the t-shirt right there. Yeah, that does, I agree. I, I'm not confirming or denying, but that's, uh, that's pretty funny of uh, a remote presentation. So I have the, uh, it is a, um, my variable for my UFO sound and an instance of the sound effect that I'm going to create and play. And so now when I load the content, Uh, I'm going to uh, bring that in here. So I need this sound effect for UFO flying. I'm going to create the instance. I'm going to set it up as a loop, and then I'm going to play it. And we'll wait until the uh, sirens go by. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to unmute my PC and turn it up really loud, and we'll see if we get some sound effects here. All right, so we're getting there. Uh, and then you can just leave that, you know, leave your phone sitting on your friend's desk or hiding under his desk and just let that go. <laughs> uh, you can also do cool things. We're not going to do it here, but you can pan the audio left and right. You can introduce Doppler effects for objects moving closer or farther away. So that's pretty neat. Um, what I want to do, uh, one more thing that I want to do with this, well, actually two more things real quick. One is I'm going to add some touch interactivity to the game. Right now, it's not a game. It's more or less a movie. So we want to do some uh, interactivity with this. So I'm going to bring in another sound effect. And this is going to be sort of a hit sound, like a laser blast. We'll bring that in. And what we're going to do is load that again into a variable real quick. All right, and then we're going to put this uh, snippet of code down in here. Oops. Uh, it's right here. Nope, that's not where it goes. Uh, we need to load the content again. And this is called um, hit. And then what we're going to do is in the update, we're going to check to see if the user has touched the screen. That again. OK, this is where it is. So we're going after something called touch collection of the touch panel. Uh, your phones support up to four touch points. In this particular game, we're only going after the first touch point. So in this case, if we've got any points where the user is touching the screen when this game is updating, we're going to take the first touch location here. And if it's pressed, meaning the user is touching the screen as opposed to removing their finger from the screen, we're going to create a point from that position. That's here, touch point. We're going to take a rectangle that represents the ship's position. And then if the rectangle contains the touch point, we're going to play the sound. So let's run that. And now, again, I'm not sure if you can hear it, but if I click on the screen, I don't get a sound. But if I click on the ship, I'm getting a different sound. Can you guys hear that? Kind of. Kind of? OK. Well, I'm going to give you one more quick thing that'll be uh, a representation of the hits, and that's um, text. So if I want to put text on the screen, what I need to do is create a font file. And a font file is simply an XML file that identifies a font that I want to use, in this case, Sego UI Mono, a font size, which is 22 uh, points, spacing, kerning, all that kind of stuff. I define the font, and then I use this font to display a string of text to the screen. I'm going to create a variable up at the top that's going to hold my score.
uh, oops, no, it's going to be um, sprite font, game font. And I need a position for my text. Text position equals new vector two. And we're going to put it just inside the top left corner of the screen. And then I need a variable to keep track of my score. We're going to start at zero. We'll load the font in our load content here. Content.load. We're going to convert it to a sprite font. Notice you don't need the dot sprite font extension because here the asset name is simply game display. And then whenever the user scores a direct hit on the spaceship, we're going to add one to their score. And then uh, when it's time to draw, we will draw our score. So we're going to draw it using that game font. We're going to have the words score followed by the actual number. And the position is that top left corner. And this should make our game worth 99 cents. <coughs> so clicking on the ship, I get a score. Clicking off the ship, I get no score. So that's how you can draw some text. All right, so if we get the credit cards out, 99 cents, you can make it payable to me. Um, Edwin, are there any questions out there? Any questions? All right, go ahead. Yeah, so you're talking about those 99 cents, you know, app purchase. Is there an ad model in Windows Phone? Is there an ad model in Windows Phone? Yes, there's definitely an ad model in Windows Phone. Uh, not only that, is we have a very easy way for you to add an ad banner to the bottom of a Silverlight app, or in fact, if your game, if I wanted to have a banner at the bottom advertising you know, things while the user's shooting it at UFOs, I could absolutely do that. It's a very easy control to add. Um, you get the same revenue model, which is 70-30. Uh, so you would get 70% of the ad revenue. And it's based on impressions, although really the number is based on total clicks over time. Uh, but it is based on impressions. So you just need to be showing the ad banner, and you can make a nice revenue stream from that. Yeah, if you guys want to do some type of hackathon or work on this, um, I can help you monetize uh, monetize your apps. We've had students actually win a lot of money uh, monetizing apps. Go ahead. Another thing I was wondering is, what sort of gesture support does Windows, uh, does the Windows Phone support? Like, uh, What's, like kind of custom gestures like for your app or other things like that? What type of full, um, gestures does Windows Phone uh, support? Can you, what was the last part? Uh, and like, can you like have custom gestures? Can you have custom gestures as well? Yeah, there's standard gestures you can support, which would be swipes and flicks and pan gestures, uh, pinch and zoom, uh, zooming in and out with multiple touch points. You can interpret those as gesture right on the touchpad, which is great because you don't have to calculate, uh, you know, how far does the user move to tell the difference between a swipe and a flick. Um, you can just receive it as that actual event. If you want a lower level, then you can absolutely go after the raw touch points. But in fact, most games are, are gesture driven just because it's less calculations for you have to do. Okay, another question, Glenn. Can we get uh, test phones to test their apps on? Can you get test phones to test your apps on? I am the person to do that. If you want a test phone for testing your apps, email me, let's make it happen. Cool? Mm -hmm. All right. You can also email me. And you can email Dean. Email both of us, we'll put your email address up here. But don't email us separately so you end up with two phones. <laughs> Go ahead. Is there an equivalent to interface builder for this? Is there an equivalent to interface builder to this, Glenn? Uh, for interface builder, that would be where you're actually writing uh, Silverlight applications. That would give you a true design surface. I think Edwin's going to show that maybe in a bit. Um, and that's more of a drag and drop, and I want to bring some buttons and a list box and some check boxes on. That is really not very well suited for 2D and definitely not for 3D gaming. You would need to use the XNA framework. 
like we're doing here, where you're basically drawing everything yourself. Now that being said, you're not going to be expected to write line after line of code if you've got really complex game elements. Instead, you would wrap those up into a game component and then the game system would say, hey component, update yourself or draw yourself. And it would take care of that, it would take care of any interactivity that it's doing, you know, two spaceships crash together, you know, they would need to both deform a certain way. So you can have all those things talking to each other, but again, you do have to write all the code to do that. Okay. A lot more questions, actually. I'm going to reserve question, uh, the shirts for okay. good, good questions, because I'm running out. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to show you one more, okay. one more quick okay. thing, and go that's ahead, um, something found in this starter kit. When you go to the download site for the tools, you also access the developer resources and training material. One of them is this starter kit, which is, this one's called Platformer. There is a version of this for Xbox 360, phone, and PC. And really, there's hardly any difference between the code between any of it. But let me just run the platformer real quick so see what it looks like. It's a really nice way to get started doing platforming game development because you can swap out all the assets. So there's some neat little animation going on here. I've got my little character at the bottom of the screen. I can make them jump. Hey, Glenn, um, hold on. It's, uh, it's not updating the screen. Is there... Okay, hold on. Sorry, it's coming up now. Go ahead. Yeah. You're good. So I got my little character there. I got some background music happening. Um, I, normally, I would be able to control this with the tilt of my phone, but because I'm in the emulator, I don't really have good support for that. But it's just a nice illustration of that. So if you go and download the starter kit for the uh, platformer, that's a really great starting point for you. Okay, question. All right, uh, Edwin, how much time do we have left in this session? Uh, you got another at least 10 minutes. And then you said a uh, phone gap would be about 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay, so another so good... Are there, any other, are there any other XNA questions? There are. Hold on. It, I, it's okay. More, it's a more general question, oh. but like Game Center on iOS, I assume there's some Xbox Live ecosystem where people can post high scores and compete with one another. So how, how do you integrate that with your games? Is so there Xbox Live ecosystem? How do you integrate that with your games? Something similar to what's on... And Game Center on the iOS. Game Center on the iOS. Okay. Um, so that's an excellent question. We do have oh my God. the ability for <laughs> Windows to open the games. Hold on, Glenn. All right, Mass Effect or Gears of War 2? Did he get a shirt? All right, go ahead, Glenn. Answer. Okay. So the Xbox, I'm oh, sorry, Windows Phone supports Xbox Live integration. Uh, and you saw that earlier with, with the demo of the, of the Game Center on there. From a developer's perspective, you can write games for the Windows Phone and publish them through the marketplace using just the regular um, App Hub subscription, which if you're in the DreamSpark program, I think there's no annual fee um, for that. Now, if you want to have a game that has integration with Xbox Live, including achievements, your friends, um, you know, the ability to do turn-by-turn -turn game requests right through the Xbox Live system on the phone. That's a separate arrangement that you would need to make with the Xbox Live team. Um, that sort of arrangement is usually reserved for companies that have a couple of solid games under their belt or are working with an existing publisher that already has that arrangement with the Xbox Live team. And that being said, it's not off-limits for anybody because, you know, if you get a couple of games in market, and you know they're pretty neat, and you can show a great reason to integrate with the Xbox Live services. Um, you know you can get in touch with Edwin, and he can put you in touch with the Xbox Live team. You know, outside of that, we see people that are setting up their own services to uh, track this. You know, for, for scores, a popular game that's across all three platforms that I like to play is Words by Post. I don't know if you guys know that one, but that has a separate um, you know game tag system and a separate score system and a separate turn-by-turn -turn system that exists outside of Xbox Live, that's totally fine. That developer created it from scratch and it supports all three of the platforms that his game runs on, which is iPhone, Android, and Windows Phone. So that's what most people are doing you know, if they don't have an agreement with the Xbox Live team. Cool. Uh, one more question, yeah. Um, a big problem with Android was the backwards compatibility and with the fragmentation. Can you talk about how So uh, yeah, there's a fragmentation in Android uh, marketplace. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about uh, building for uh, building apps or games for this phone moving forward with you know all the other devices coming out? Sure. Um, there's two main con uh, concepts when you're talking about fragmentation. One is the actual devices themselves. 
You know, they have all kinds of different screen resolutions. They might have different kinds of controls. Uh, and the other one would be the, you know, the core version of the OS that's running on the device. Uh, one of the great things about Windows Phone is that it's the same operating system on all of the, the phones. So when you write a game for Windows Phone 7, it's going to run on, on pretty much every single device. Now, the one caveat for that is that there are additional markets coming out where there's going to be some devices that have lower memory uh, uh, stipulations. Uh, with those lower memory stipulations, there are a few things that you would have in a full Windows Phone app that you wouldn't be able to have on those devices, such as background tasks um, and that type of thing. But for the most part, the XNA games that you write are going to translate across all the different uh, devices that are out there. You know, they're all touch screen, they're all 800 by 480, uh, they all have an accelerometer, they all have a GPS. So, you know, that's a really common platform for you to be able to target. And uh, it just makes it much easier when you're writing games or any kind of app, really. Okay. Uh, one more question, we'll let Glenn move on a bit. Yep. So we've been talking about monetization stuff. What's the support for in-app purchases? Yeah. Right. Or policy, yep. Um, we don't have an existing framework. I believe that that's on the roadmap. Uh, again, I can't really speak for the Windows Phone team and where they're going with that. Um, you know, currently there are providers that, um, like, you know, Amazon, for example, when you buy a book, you want to read it through Kindle. There's the Kindle app on Windows Phone, so you're, you're able to do that. Um, we don't have plumbing in place on our side for an in-app purchase. Or you're able to, if you want to set up your own plumbing to do that, that's that's fine. Okay, keep going, Glenn. Okay. Um, so the other approach that I'm going to show you for writing Windows Phone games or Windows Phone apps is something called Phone Gap, and this is a great platform for um, uh, cross-platform compatibility. Phone Gap allows you to write an application in HTML5, uh, use a lot of the HTML5 things you already know about. Uh, like geolocation and index DB and, and you know canvas that sort of thing it allows you to use lots of JavaScript libraries like jQuery and, and, and tons of others that as long as they're pure JavaScript implementations will be able to work and then you package up your code your HTML5 app inside of a, con a host container for deployment to that multiple platform and we've recently announced and they've come out with uh, phone gap for the Windows phone now, the, it's actually part of this project called, um, uh, what do they call it now? I forget what they call it. Cordova, sorry, Project Cordova. And Phone Gap is an implementation of that. It's a great way to get started if your skills are in HTML5 and JavaScript. However, you know, because it is still running as if it's in a browser, there are a couple of quirky little UI limitations that, that I'm going to show you as we go through. But in essence, what you do is you go and you download this, this runtime, you add it to Visual Studio, which is what we were using earlier, and you're able to create um, HTML5 applications and have them hosted in, in, in a Windows Phone app. So the way you would create it would be, once it's installed on your system, we would do File, New Project. We would pick um, the template for phone gaps. I'm just going to search my templates. This one's called Cordova Starter 3, so I'll hit OK. And it's going to get a project that has a hosting page for my application, and then a whole www folder that has all the actual files on my application. So in this case, if I pulled up index.html, you see I've had this text at the top that says, hello Cordova, and I've got this other thing at the bottom, I've got this div down here. I've got um, a style sheet with a bunch of styles inside there. And I've got this Cordova JavaScript file. And this handles the interaction between the JavaScript that's called from the index.html and the underlying runtime for Cordova, which is called gaplib, and that's up here. Those are all included in the template. So now what I would do is I would simply open my HTML file and I would start adding my HTML and my JavaScript uh, here I can create additional folders, you know, I can add a new folder if I wanted and put JavaScript files or images in there, <clears throat> and then I can write my code this way. From here I can also, you know, reach into the local file system and do, and do something. I can reach out to the internet and pull some data down. 
you know, I can um, have various controls on the screen, buttons and labels and text, and, um, text boxes and so on. So if I were to run this now, you essentially would see a Windows Phone application come up. Let me rotate it back. You'll see a Windows Phone application come up. And it'll be a blank screen until this HTML takes over. This is the splash screen right here. And then here's the HTML talk coming over. And now we also have this message, Cordova is ready. And let's look and see where that came from. If I look in the source from my HTML5 page, you'll see I've got a little script here. So the script is referencing, first of all, the Cordova.js file. And then secondly, the script is adding a, an event handler for device ready, and that's when all the scripts have parsed and loaded. And then on device ready, we're doing two things. We're writing out to this div that Cordova is ready, and then we're getting window.device.cordova, and that's going to give us the version. And then secondly, we're using a little debugging here, which allows us to do some console logging, and that output was right down, oops, scroll too far. That um, log is right down here. Okay, so it would be at this point that you would then expand on this project, and you would build additional capabilities uh, for your code in, um, in HTML and JavaScript. I'm going to open up the test project, the example project that comes with this phone gap library. And notice this has a slightly more complex www folder. And they've got examples in here for interacting with contacts, uh, compass if your phone has one, camera, uh, audio things like playing music, location services, your network, those are all found in here. So if I were to run this, I'd see my HTML5 app loading, running within my phone, uh, my phone app here. And I could go, for example, to Accelerometer. And now in my emulator, I'm going to open up Accelerometer. And right now I'm going to get the position, which is uh, zero, almost zero, and zero. So now if I take this and rotate it, and I do get acceleration, you see I get different numbers. So this is the HTML5 code interacting with the underlying Windows Phone application that's being hosted in. I can do things like um, location. Um, I can do the camera, capture an image, I can test your network connection, I can go after contacts, talk to the file system, do location, uh, do notifications if I want, do some local storage. So there's a wide variety of things you can do. Now this code that you're seeing would run pretty much unchanged if this were PhoneGap for iOS and, and or PhoneGap for Android. And that's really a great starting point. But at some point, you're going to want to bring in Windows Phone specific features. So I'm going to show you a couple of phone gap things that allow you to do that. The important thing you want to do, though, is do the, add the features in such a way that they don't, they don't break your code for the other platforms. You want to be able to maintain cross-platform compatibility between, between devices. So here's an example of integrating phone gap with one of the constructs on Windows Phone, which is called our app bar. Now, the first thing I want to show you is the app bar. I think you may have seen it already in some of the other demos. But if I go into the search app on the phone, uh, this is not my phone gap stuff running. This is just a Bing search app that comes with Windows Phone. The app bar is what lives along the bottom of the screen. You see I have four buttons on my app bar. <clears throat> the first one is local scout. The next thing is for doing music identification, which is a little bit like Shazam. This is for doing visual identification, and this is for giving your phone some voice commands. In addition, I have menus down here. And the nice thing about the app bar is if I rotate the phone, the buttons will rotate properly to the bottom, uh, interfere with the screen, and have a nice translucency there. So how would we add one of these to our phone gap application? 
A lot of people take the approach of saying, well, I'll just duplicate this in HTML5 and JavaScript. I'll make a div that I'm gonna pop up and down, I'll put some icons on it, I'll manage you know, click events on the divs. And it turns out that you really kinda of wanna keep the app bar outside of your HTML for your phone gap, because it's so much easier to work with. Uh, let me go to my code now for my phone gap application and show you that what I've done is I have my phone gap view. This is my HTML5 host right there. But then below it, I have my phone application page. I have one button on this page, and the icon is refresh. It's a little graphic. And then I have a little bit of C-sharp code that when the user clicks on the refresh button, it goes into the web part of the application and invokes a script called app bar refresh. App bar refresh is on my index.html page right here. So this is some nice interactivity between the hosting Windows Phone application and the Phone Gap application. So I'll run it and you'll see that this the app bar in our Phone Gap app now looks just like the app bar for any other Windows Phone app, and it gives a nice sense of continuity. So there's the phone gap um, app bar button. So I'll click refresh, and every time I click it, it'll just give me the latest date and time. So that's one type of interactivity. That's within the app. Now let's say you didn't like that, and you don't want to do anything to change the UI or your app between the different platforms. That's fine, still a lot of interesting things you can do. Uh, one of them is to integrate with Bing Search. So if I open a project here that is, again, a phone gap application, but it's a Bing Maps search task. And we will go down into our uh, www folder. And down in our, uh, that's not where we want, in our uh, main page, we have a search for this Bing Maps button. And this map button is going to call the show gap function. Here's the show map function. I'm going to get my current position, and I'm going to then show any items that are found near that position. So this would be how I would search for a Starbucks uh, near me. Now this uh, Bing Maps plugin is actually a little bit of C-sharp code that bridges the gap between PhoneGap and the Windows Phone application. If I go into the plugins library here, you'll see I have this PG Bing Maps. And this just defines the connection between my uh, PhoneGap JavaScript and my uh, Windows Phone application. Let's go ahead and run this. I'm going to simulate my location services. So in my emulator, I'm actually going to pretend I'm at a certain location. I'm going to put 30009, which is, um, or 30002, which is Atlanta. I'm not actually in Florida, as Edwin said, I'm in Atlanta. And uh, this detected the geolocation API is supported. So if I set my point right here, that's going to be where the application and the phone emulator thinks I am. So now, if I type in um, Starbucks, and I'll search, it should give me Starbucks that are near that location. Oops. Oh, I was looking for that earlier. <laughs> yeah. Let me do a clear map here. Go back, and we'll try something else. We'll try... We'll try, let's try coffee. Ah. Okay. 
Well, let's just try Atlanta. <laughs> it's a little bit bigger than coffee. Hopefully we can find that. There we go. Okay, so there's Atlanta. Uh, yeah, yeah, it worked. <laughs> uh, really, that's the, uh, the types of things you can do with the interactivity. So that particular customization didn't require me to change anything about my phone gap application. So that's another approach as well. Um, I have all of these samples that I'm showing here posted on my blog, which is at um, glengordon.name. You can go there, and I've got a bunch of phone gap um, entries in here. So that's something you can check out. Uh, Edwin, any questions out there? Let's see. Opening it up for questions. No one. No one wants? All right, go ahead. Wait, so um, you searched Starbucks and coffee earlier. Um, is this like, you know, special case with the emulator not working or does it actually not work? Is it a, a special case where the emulator is not working or does it actually not work for the uh, search for coffee? Um, I don't know. One way you can duplicate that is if we went to search here and we went uh, to, to look for coffee. Uh, this actually worked, so it found coffee near me. So I think it was just something quirky in the demo. Um, or maybe the emulator hadn't caught up. Oh, look, that Dancing Goats coffee bar. That's interesting. <laughs> What's that? Oh, that sounds good. All right. Well, um, yeah, so that's, you know, what you're doing is you're tapping into these Bing searches from your application. And really, it should have found coffee near the location. I'm not sure why it didn't. Was there like a search radius, maybe? Yeah. Um, could be. Could have been. OK. So one more when, question. When the Zoom first came out, one of the things that differentiated it from the iPod was that you had this whole social networking aspect here where you could like share music with people and like tell them what you're listening to. And the Zoom failed like when it was compared in stats to the iPod in sales. So when it comes to Wait, the we, iPod, we don't we don't say we don't say it failed, it, it <laughs> sort of morphed. <laughs> when it comes to the iOS having such a strong market and the Android having such a yeah. strong market, how will Windows phone play against these two big competitors when at the moment it's not that strong? How will a Windows Phone play against the two competitors when it's not a super uh, strong phone right well, now? Or a super... Like, uh, the Zoom and just morph out of the market? Or is... <laughs> well, Zoom morph out of the market. I mean, Dean covered a bit of it, but go ahead. Um, go ahead, Right. Glenn. Zoom is a larger brand name that more has to do with the, 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 the services and the players independently. In fact, the full name of it was a Zoom player. Uh, you know, the music within Windows Phone, the music marketplace, that's Zoom. Uh, within the Xbox 360, when you go into the music and the video player, that's Zoom. So that, you know, that's still around. I, I think the question at the beginning was whether that social aspect of Zoom is still going to be there. Is that right? Where is it? What, what, how do you, how do you want to summarize your question? Sort of what, what is the answer so looking like, for? How would the Windows Phone compete against? How would the Windows iOS? Phone compete against iOS and Android? Um, fantastic partners like Nokia. <laughs> Uh, okay. And, you know, great applications, which, uh, you, you know, answer? the next, Go ahead. next best application has not been uh, written yet, so you guys are, are uh, poised to do so. Do you have an answer to your... Yeah, I think I Because I'm not mic here, so... Oh. Um, just to kind of summarizing what I was actually trying to get at before is that... Uh, if you look at uh, industry analysts, and again, this is not either of us talking, but uh, they're not kidding. Mm -hmm. They're saying that uh, because of our excellence in manufacturing handsets, because of our global reach, uh, and because of this amazing technology that is both a combination of hardware and software, other people are predicting that yeah. we will directly compete and succeed against the two gigantic uh, current phone platforms out there. I mean, again, it's. I think it's a, a. There's a slight thing of experience here that Apple has not always been a dominant uh, player in this space. And in fact, I myself, in my own kind of long tech career, have seen the rise and fall and rise of Apple in my own lifetime. And you are currently seeing the rise of Nokia again in a partnership with Microsoft. So. There's a lot here, and this again, this the the uh, 
the, the, the thing we're doing strategy-wise with both apps and the development of apps and this whole ecosystem as well as the platform and the phones is quite remarkable. And, and I really suggest that, you know, even in addition to these email things, just go down to an AT&T or a T-Mobile store and check it out for yourselves. In fact, the, the uh, Lumi 900, until Friday, it's free. With the, it's $99, but we credit you $100 back. It's basically free with a contract. So check it out. Mm -hmm. um, also, I mean, you know, for, for, for you know, gaming, Xbox, when that first came out, like, oh, PlayStation is the dominant one. There's no way Xbox and Microsoft can you know, get into the gaming space and look where we are now. Same thing, rise and fall of Apple and rise again. Um, it happens up and down. Um, Glenn, do you have something else? Uh, no, that was good. Okay, one more question. Yep. Oh, Glenn, yeah, this, this is a really exciting story. That's a good question. That deserves an Xbox game. Sort of, uh, you know, so we're at, um, you know, how, with Windows 8 coming out, sorry, as I right. take his hand off, <laughs> with Windows 8 coming out, um, how, how are we looking at sort of integration, um, you know, from Windows Phone to Windows 8, creating apps, sort of having this, like, nice one ecosystem where you build an app somewhere and, it, you know, you can basically port it to another thing like a Windows 8 mm -hmm. or the phone? Right. So think of it from two perspectives, right? From the end user's perspective, um, everything they see going forward is going to be Metro. Uh, Windows 8, the Metro design, you know, that took its cues, Windows Phone, which took its cues from Zune, bringing that one, you know, back into play again. The new Xbox dashboard has a lot of Metro style things with tiles. So people are going to get used to that. There's going to be a lot of cross-selling opportunities. You know, if you have a Metro design to app on Windows 8, uh, you know, sell your mobile version on Windows Phone and vice versa. So from the consumer perspective, there's going to be a nice brand identity across all the different platforms. From the developer perspective, the approach is very similar in that you're going to have a very simple UI that's, that's crisp and, and visually oriented with, uh, uh, you know, higher, high uh, contrast graphics and that sort of thing. And you're going to have a lot of reusable assets, fonts, uh, you know, styles, that sort of thing between the, the various platforms. There is, you know, potential for a convergence of the platform with the sort of right ones run anywhere. Uh, you know, we have not made any roadmap announcements in that area. Um, so today the story is simply, you know, Windows 8 development with the Metro style apps is going to be C Sharp and XAML, or Visual Basic and XAML, or HTML5 and JavaScript. And Windows Phone 7 development will continue to be um, C Sharp or Visual Basic with XAML in the form of Silverlight app or an XNA app for a 2D or 3D game. And so you'll get some code reuse across those if you have business logic or game logic. Uh, if you've got connectivity logic or you've got some server in the cloud that you're using to retrieve data and save data to, you'll be able to do all of that with um, you know, a library that you can move from a Windows 8 app over to a Windows Phone app. Uh, but that's going to be the story for a little bit of time today. Cool. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Yep, go ahead. Are there any big limitations by using PhoneGap to do development instead of uh, Visual Basic Studio? What are the limitations of uh, perhaps using PhoneGap to develop a phone app versus Visual Studio? Okay, well, so from Visual Studio, we're actually in Visual Studio, but we're using the PhoneGap framework instead of using the Silverlight framework. Well, actually, we're using both at the same time. You're just not writing anything in Silverlight. Uh, the main disadvantage is the fact that it is, in fact, a browser. So if I am running this app, just to show you uh, one of the ones that was on here that was PhoneGap, um, there's our starter kit, right? So we ran this. It's going to feel like a browser uh, because if the user... Uh, once this comes up here, if the user double taps the screen, it's going to do this little bounce in and out because it's thinking you're on a web page. Also, you know, you have the ability, in some cases, you can highlight the text and, and copy it, and, and there it is. It's going right now. So it doesn't understand that it's an app. It still thinks okay. that it's more rendering as a web page. So it's a good way to get started and get a feel, and, and primarily this uh, HTML5 is targeted at, at, at people who already have 
phone gap applications on other platforms and want to bring them to Windows Phone very quickly. But you know, as I showed, you would then begin to add Windows Phone specific features, the Bing search or an app bar or other things in the marketplace like a trial version of your app. You'd add those features little by little and eventually you, know, you would probably consider migrating over to an actual full native app instead of HTML5. So all the limitations there are basically because it's a, a mini browser running as an app. Okay. All right, we're going to actually pause for 10 seconds while they change tape, and then we'll answer one or two more questions, and then we want to kind of go through quick resources for Silverlight uh, phone development, and then I'll let you go. The question is, uh, how do you do? Uh, how difficult is it to do uh, native? I'm sorry, um, image processing uh, in PhoneGap. Um, so the answer to that would be it depends how difficult it would be to do in JavaScript. Uh, there's no libraries internal to PhoneGap to do image processing. Uh, so you would either have to find some way to do it in JavaScript or um, find some way to do it in C Sharp inside of the Silverlight app and communicate back with the hosted PhoneGap app. Or the third way would be you know, to send the image off to of some service in the cloud and then have it come back processed. So there's a couple of ways you could do it there. Okay. Any other questions for Glenn before I go do my 10 minute spiel? Okay, Glenn, thank you very much for your time. Um, really, really appreciate your All right, talk to you soon. I'm going to stop recording bye. and then uh, bye. Okay, let me save it. Glenn Gordon, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I'll let that process. Okay, so a um, couple other things. One, one more time, this bit.ly slash CS164 phone is going to bring you here, and I'm going to actually go through a demo of building a Silverlight app instead of, um, instead of a, uh, a, a game, as Glenn mentioned. So um, if you go bit.ly slash CS164, whoops, bit.ly slash CS164 phone. What's cool here too is some of these um, links we're going to give you sample code, which I'm going to go through. But you know, if you want to create a phone app, if you want, I'm sorry, a map. Uh, if you want to create something with your um, with your um, accelerometer, uh, I'll, I'll show you a couple of these examples. But it's pretty cool. Um, this jump start series over here shows videos, so it's actually videos of um, different uh, examples, and they provide the code. The code is this link which gives you all the, the code and the presentation zipped. So if you really want to get quick started, this is a great way to do it. Um, so one thing I'm going to do right now is I'll highlight a couple of things um, you know, with phone development. So first, maybe I'll do a quick uh, hello world just so you get familiar with um, adding elements and, and creating a hello world app on the phone. So when you, um, when you install, going through uh, WP7SDKTools, bit.ly, It'll bring you to uh, the SDK tools, and you can just install Visual Studio 2010. It includes all the phone development tools. So I'll walk you through sort of creating that, um, that first phone app, right? Over here, again, if you're not familiar with the IDE, you have new project on the top left. And after you install the SDK, what you're going to see is Visual, uh, Visual C Sharp, Silverlight for Windows Phone. It has all these different templates. So if I scroll down, you'll see one has to do with Panorama. Um, as you saw Dean go through some Panorama apps, uh, there's Pivot, but let's start from the beginning, straight up uh, Windows Phone application. I'm going to double click on it, choose Windows Phone OS 7.1, and what you'll see is the uh, emulator load, uh, as well as in the middle, you'll see this thing called XAML um, on the, in the middle, and then on the right you'll see this sort of user uh, interface type of um, uh, being able to mess around with the properties, etc. So my, I don't have great real estate over here. I'm going to zoom out a bit. So my emulator is on the left. Um, I have my XAML code in the middle, and I have sort of this this UI way of um, of modifying some of the code, some of the XAML as well. Um, first thing I'm going to do, let's go ahead, and I'm going to put my mouse over toolbox, and you'll see that um, I have all these different elements available to me. Uh, so actually, I'm going to move this over just so I can drag it into the phone. So toolbox, let me go ahead and uh, you know drag and drop a text block. So over here, here's my text block. I can drag it. You'll see these little orange markers over here. So it's sort of like a snap to ability and a really cool interface where you can see the, how large the pixel size is. Uh, I'm going to name this um, object over here text block, my text block. Okay. And you'll see um, over here now, 
the text also says text block. I'm going to say this. I'm going to keep it blank. I'm going to delete what's over here. So it's blank and you'll see text block go away. Also if I click on the object on the XAML part, I'm going to drag it over here. You'll see text block height equals 52. Um, you know, text is blank. Uh, horizontal alignment left width once you know 183 I'll change this to say you know 100 right and it you know there's multiple ways the point is there's multiple ways to uh, modify your um, your objects either through XAML over here or um, on the properties over here you can even do um, let's see height you could even do a search right on which property that you want to modify height right there I'm gonna go back to toolbox let me drag, drag this out toolbox I'm going to create a button, right? All I have to do is drag a button into the. Uh, it's kind of. Oop, I got to move this over. Sorry again because I'm projecting. Let's do that again. Button over here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to name this my button. Enter. Right, and the content. If I click on it, I see that um, I'm going to remove this. I see the content property over here is button, so I'm going to say click me, right? And it says click me over here. Now if I can actually drag this and move this around, you see how it snaps, right? So you can actually have pretty good alignment right there. Click me. So anyone know how to uh, create an event or event handler for a button? Like if I click on this button, it will do some piece of code. Anyone guess? What do I do? Double click the button, right? I can double click the button. And it brings me to my C sharp code, right? It creates an event handler, my button uh, underscore click. Um, it already, you know, uh, creates it automatically. So if I do uh, C sharp, my text block, and if you don't know Visual um, Studio, there's something called IntelliSense where it really takes a lot of the guessing out of the code when you're developing. So my text block dot text, right? It gives you all these different suggestions, right? If you do on apply template text, you click on it, it actually gives you more information. So text equals hello CS164. Bam, right? Um, now I'm going to hit this play button it's in, uh, to start debugging. And what it'll do is it'll bring up my emulator, it'll um, um, go through the code, and the first time you run the emulator, it takes about 10 seconds, right? So, um, really, really simple way to develop an app. Uh, for the phone. So while this is running, let's see, I have so many cool things, especially if you guys, I, I wanted to show uh, creating an app um, with one line of code. And something that uh, when I did this at UPenn to do a demo, um, someone was an Android uh, intern and he said it would take him about five to six hours to do what I just did with one line of code. So um, the developer story we, we have is actually pretty good. Um, and I want to kind of get that, oh, of course, hold on. You know what, it's probably because I dragged that other button uh, in there. I thought we would go by really easily without an error. Okay, it was that second button. I forgot, I, I could have just fixed it right there. My bad. I just want to do this right from the beginning. Okay, let's go to new project. And I'll kind of skip a lot of the, uh, the steps that I did. show you right from the start. All right, real quick. I mean, that's like the simplest uh, demo. I shouldn't have uh, not even done anything. Let's see, all right, here we go. Text block, insert. All right, name this my text block. My text block, let me see if I can do this speedily. Okay, toolbox, button. Let's not care what uh, what the contents are, and I call this my button. Okay, done. Double click on my button. Insert uh, my text block dot text equals hello CS164 part two. Okay, play. Debug. Okay, deploying application, if you see this on the bottom left, and bless you. Here you go, bam. Hello, 60, uh, CS164, part two. Um, 
Let me show you something real quick. I only have four minutes. You guys want to see so a little more of this thing or the designer app where you have something cool in, in, in one line of code? <laughs> sure, that was kind of dumb. All right, cool. So um, this is part of the sample code that is in the uh, CS164 phone link. It actually has this sample code for what I'm going to show. Um, so for example, I'm gonna get, I'll do this real quick. It's under blend. Uh, when you download it, you'll see it. Um, it's under animations, begin. Flip card. Uh, I must have put it somewhere else. Okay. Don't mind me. I did this for MIT too, so you'll see MIT. Sorry. <laughs> did I delete it? No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I have all the pictures and stuff that I want to show you. Let me see if I could do this real quick. Hold on. Oh my gosh. Plenty of talks. Maybe I could do this kind of with like random pictures then. Okay, random pictures. All right, let's give it a shot. Okay, so um, let me do new project. I'll create something new. I can't believe it's not there. Okay, so um, one of the cool things too is uh, part of Visual Studio, we have something called Expression Blend. So if you're more of a designer, you can right click on your project over here and then open an Expression Blend. And it'll open this in a more designer situation, uh, situated environment. Oh, this is bugging me now. I can't believe it's not here. Nope. Demo code and presentations, maybe? Yeah, all right. I can, but I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> it's, I know what folder it's in. I'm going to click yes. I'll see there's some pictures. I don't know if I want to, hold on. Display mute. <laughs> I'm going to drag some pictures in here. Uh, let's see, something easy. OK, here we go. Here's an icon. And Edwin and George. OK. Let's go back. Okay, here we go. Edwin and George. This is kind of silly. So here's me. Here's George. Okay. I'm going to, it's supposed to be like the front and back of a card. Um, so if I do uh, zero, 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 I'm basically making sure this picture covers the entire screen. So if I click on George, this is George Matthews, by the way. He works at Microsoft Nerd. And I um, click this thing called Storyboard on the bottom. I'm going to call this my uh, Rotate. Oh, God, we have one minute. Rotate card. Let's see if I can get this done. All right, so what I'm going to do over here now, there's something called Transform. And if I expand that, I can actually rotate this image, right? So uh, I'm going to create a, um, a marker over here. And at time one, I'm going to um, make the y-axis 90 degrees. So what ends up happening is if I go to the start, bam, OK? So I'm going to even make a, an effect. I'm going to click on that little keystone over there, and I'm going to make that easing function maybe elastic, something kind of crazy. So let's go back. Whoa. Oh my god. OK, so now I'm gonna, I am going to uh, close that. And here's my one line of code. Let me see if I can get this going. Um, what I want to do is uh, click on George, and I'm going to go to events, which is actually over here. Where is it? Oh my gosh. It's like over here, sorry, events. Now, there's a tap event. So it's basically if I tap, I'm going to double click on tap. Oh, let's see if I can get this done. Uh, let's see, this dot rotate card dot begin. That's my one line of code. This should deserve a round of applause if I get this to work. And I could redeem myself, um, run project. And basically, if you have two cards, you can tap on each card, and it'll like rotate. OK, here we go. Let's run it. Cross your fingers. Here's George. Click. And then that's your app. Okay. <laughs> All right, 3 o'clock on the dot. So if you have any questions, here's my contact information. You got the um, place you can download. Seriously, if you want uh, loaner devices so you can test stuff out, I'm happy to do that. And Dean will work with me on that as well. Cool? If you have any questions, let me know. One line of code, people. Look at that. <laughs>